tree snake. So the brown tree snake is native in um, tropical Africa through uh, southern parts of Asia. It arrived in Guam. So you can see on this map, Guam is a very small isolated island in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it was believed that it fell off of airplane landing gear in the 1950s. Most of Guam, Guam, there were no snakes were native to Guam before this time. But the brown tree snake, and so birds uh, and mammals like bats would just nest in all sorts of places all over the ground. And again, there weren't snakes, so there wasn't a concern in these native species. What happened over time is basically all the native birds and a lot of the native mammals have been eliminated, extirpated, but eliminated or killed off by the brown tree snake. So the brown tree snake um, has had huge impacts. So the invasive species is the brown tree snake. It was native to, again, going back for a second, there's pictures of it, kind of creepy looking, native to like tropical Africa. And it's believed, again, it came through um, like uh, cargo uh, or airplanes that it, it kind of got to the island of Guam. What it has done is wiped out most of the native birds and native uh, mammal species there. What's the problem with this? Well, there's a lot of different problems. It's interrupted a lot of ecological processes. So flying foxes are actually a bat, but they are a type of pollinator. So um, they wiped out pollination. And again, this is a tropical island that grows a lot of tropical fruits and things. And so a lot of pollinators have been wiped out. There's a lot less birds there on the island. So there's a much higher insect population, which impacts tourism because no one really wants to go there. Uh, reduces the yield of fruit crops because you don't have the native pollinators there. And um, there are other, like tourists would want to go there. And again, now there's the snake, there's more insects, a lot of native birds that used to, or seabirds that nested there don't nest there. So huge economic and ecological impacts. And in fact, the brown tree snakes are so bad, they're linked with power outages, where you'll actually have so many brown tree snakes on power lines they get power outages from them. So pretty crazy impacts from the brown tree snake. Um, bottom line is what we've learned from the brown tree snake is at the first sign of an invasive species, it may seem extreme, but do everything you can to eliminate it. Big idea is prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, the Once a native species becomes rooted into an area, it's virtually impossible to get it out. So in our area, in the Chicago area, the buckthorn, it's just here. There's really no way to get rid of it because there's so many of them. So that's one of the lessons we've learned is prevention is essential. Um, interesting thing that they've discovered though is they found that brown tree snakes um, will hemorrhage or kind of bleed to death from Tylenol. So what they are starting to do is over, again, this is a tropical rainforest, is they're taking a mice, dead mice, freezing them, they don't want to introduce another problematic species, uh, and filling them with Tylenol. Then they drop them over, I know this seems crazy, but they drop them by plane loads in the rainforest in Guam. They, the mice or rats, thaw out, the snakes find them, the brown tree snakes find them. And again, there were originally no native snakes there on Guam, so they're not concerned about hurting native snakes. The brown tree snakes eat the rats and then bleed or hemorrhage to death. Um, and this causes them, they slip into a coma and die. So this is the latest thing, way they're trying to control the brown tree snake. Will it eliminate it? No, but maybe it can help control it and things can come back into some sort of ecological balance, but huge amounts of work going into controlling the brown tree snake. Next, we're gonna have the sea lamprey. The sea lamprey is an issue in the Great Lakes. You see that black thing stuck on the side of the fish? That is a sea lamprey. It looks like a huge leech. And if you look at the image on the left side of the screen, that's its mouth, and that's how it grabs on and sucks the blood out of fish. So the sea lamprey, were um, were always, they would spend some of their life out in the Saragasso Sea, out in the Atlantic Ocean, and then they would, um, then they go back and they go into freshwater um, streams to lay their eggs. And so if you look at this image here, Niagara Falls is right there between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. 
So the lamprey would um, always be in Lake Ontario and the tributaries or rivers off of it. But again, there were natural predators and things for it. And But it stopped there at Niagara Falls because water flows down. So the water from Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Huron is flowing down. Lake Erie goes down Niagara Falls to Ontario. So Niagara Falls was a natural barrier um, to the lamprey, except the Welland Canal was built. And the Welland Canal is a system of locks and dams to go around Niagara Falls because, again, the cheapest way to transport goods is by boat. So they built the system of locks going around Niagara Falls. Well, what's gone around with the boats is the sea lamprey. The sea lamprey got around and then got into all the Great Lakes and caused a major collapse in the lake trout population and other fish populations in the Great Lakes in the 1950s and 1960s. Again, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, parts of Minnesota, uh, Canada were used fishing in the Great Lakes was a huge uh, way they, they for their economies. And so when you have this collapse where the amount of lake trout goes down drastically, this was a big economic and ecological impact. With the sea lamprey, they were actually able to discover that if they apply a chemical called a lampricide, um, side means kill at the end, so it's a chemical that kills uh, sea lampreys in their early stage. If they apply this into streams and tributaries, so rivers feeding into the Great Lakes, um, then they are able to control the lamprey eel. So this is a problem. It was a bigger problem back basically 50 years ago. And to this day, we still have to go and apply this chemical every year in these streams and tributaries or the sea lamprey becomes a big deal in the Great Lakes. So in Lake Michigan, those things are swimming around in Lake Michigan. They're still there, but there's not as many of them there because we control it now with this chemical that has to be added every year. So understanding the impacts of the things that we do. So building the lock uh, the lock and dam mechanism to go around for shipping for economic reasons to go around Niagara Falls has made uh, a huge impact on the Great Lakes and we always have to apply this lampricide. Another thing from in the Great Lakes that has come in is the zebra mussel. The zebra mussel is very tiny. It's about the size of the tip of your pinky and actually this map is out of date now because the zebra mussel now is really found almost all over the United States. Um, but basically what has happened is the zebra mussel was brought in through the St. Lawrence Seaway and got into the Great Lakes. And um, the ballast of a ship, so this shows a ballast, okay? So what will happen is to keep the uh, ship stable, the center of gravity has to be basically um, below the sea level. And so when a ship is carrying a lot of cargo, it will um, have to, it'll have to um, uh, empty its ballast tanks. But then when it um, lets go of its cargo, then it's going to have to take in water from the ballast tanks. So what you're seeing here is at number one at the source port, it's taking in ballast water. So what is believed to have been happen is a ship took in ballast water in the Caspian Sea, transports it, so number two, during the voyage, transports all this ballast water, so all this water from the Caspian Sea, got over into the Great Lakes. And image number three, you can see then as it was loading the cargo, okay, now it starts releasing the ballast water, and it releases water from the Caspian Sea into the Great Lakes. Caspian Sea is similar conditions to the Great Lakes, and non-native species got introduced to the um, to the Great Lakes, and that non-native species was the zebra mussel. So again, it was transported in the ballast water, and it has spread through all of the Great Lakes. And again, from this image, this is an old image. It's in the Great Lakes and now rivers and tributaries. And these are so small, the larvae of them are so small that now I can take a bucket of water um, from the Great Lakes and often it has enough larva in it. And if I um, catch some minnows in Lake Michigan and then I bring it to Lake Opeka and dump it in there, um, I could introduce the zebra mussel into Lake Opeka. Um, so a lot of issues with them. Again, the locks and dams were part of a mechanism of how they got introduced into that. 
Uh, the zebra mussel impacts. They clog pipes. The shells wash, wash up on beaches. Um, they've destroyed native species. There's so many of them, they cover native species. So in this picture, you can see like this is a crayfish uh, covered with zebra mussels. So it can't survive being covered with all of these um, these uh, zebra mussels. And so that's a huge impact on it. Um, they're filter feeders. And so they have actually increased the clarity of Lake Michigan, which is good um, in some regards, but also then it increases like some algae growth. Um, and we uh, often get funny tastes in the Lake Michigan water seasonally because of that increased algae growth. So um, again, big idea prevention, if there's a way to prevent. So some suggestions are, um, Boats won't be allowed to discharge ballast water or they will have to maybe chlorinate their ballast water or um, things like that to prevent introduction of invasive species in the future. And we go back to that constant battle of economics versus the environment. Um, so this is one of the issues that we're finding is, again, controlling a well-established species is if there's a way to prevent. So thinking about the future, what are we going to do to prevent them? One of the interesting things, though, is the round goby was not intentionally introduced, but was accidentally introduced to uh, back into the Great Lakes. And the round goby is native to the Caspian Sea and it eats zebra mussels. So it is actually helping to control the zebra mussel population now. But then it is also... Um, causing its own range of issues. So an invasive species, a na native predator, is now taking care of the zebra mussel to some extent, but it's making its own